Yes, I'm Rosemary Keene. I'm a board co-chair of Mass Peace Action. And I'm happy to be hosting this wonderful group who've come here tonight to tell us about how the healthcare system is coping with the COVID-19 virus pandemic. Um, we will, I thought we would start with, um, with Donna Kelly Williams, who is the president of the MNA. Following Donna's talk, we'll hear from Vaughn Goodwin, senior organizer with 1199 SEIU. Then we'll go to pa Dr. Pam Edelstein, who is at the Codman Square Health Center. Then over to Chelsea, uh, Gladys Vega will tell us about the work that the Chelsea <coughs> Collaborative is doing. And then Dr. Julie Levison will talk about her work as an infectious disease physician at the MGH Chelsea Healthcare Center. And then Savina will bring us home with the comprehensive uh, point of view of the Poor People's Campaign. So Donna Kelly Williams is a certified pediatric nurse. She's been a staff nurse at the bedside for 45 years and was elected president of the Mass Nurses Association in 2009. The MNA represents 23,000 bedside nurses. And in addition to her RN, Donna has a degree in labor studies from UMass Boston. Donna, thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, and this, thank you also for this opportunity to talk about what we are seeing on the very front line of this pandemic. Um, so I, I would like to first um, confirm the fact that we are indeed at the um, beginning of the surge. I don't think we're quite to the peak, but we're definitely seeing the surge in all of our facilities right now. Um, I unfortunately do not feel that we are totally ready for this surge. And what I continue to hear from the front line of our staff um, is that we are still struggling to get the appropriate PPE and also to have very clear guidelines um, from the state as well as the CDC, as well as the FDA, as well as our own Department of Public Health on who should be mask, have wear a mask at what time within the facility, who um, our position has been very clear since the beginning that we're at a point in this pandemic where we have to assume that everyone is COVID positive. We know from many of the studies from outlying countries that have already uh, gone through a lot of what we are seeing right now is that up to 50% of the people that are COVID positive and are transmitters of the virus are asymptomatic. They are absolutely showing no signs of the infection, but will continue to spread the infection. And, and that is probably our biggest concern. So in the hospital setting, to ensure that everyone is fitted with an N95 mask, a new N95 mask, which is the gold standard of protection for healthcare workers who are in the midst of caring for patients that are shred, uh, shedding a great deal of the virus, which makes them more susceptible to um, contracting this virus. So we continue our work every week. We do an, an assessment of what we're seeing across the state and we send a letter to the governor. We're in the process right now of preparing our seventh letter to the governor, which outlines what we're seeing on the front line and, and especially what we need. Uh, besides the PPE, um, we're also talking about the consistency of testing. The uh, criteria for testing has not been standardized across the state and that's a great concern because in order to really look at where we are going to go to survive this pandemic, we need to have consistency in how and who we're testing what testing agents we're using, decrease the failure rate. We have right now a, a, a false negative uh, rate of about up to 28%, which is very concerning. Um, so we do want to standardize that and also have access for all of our frontline workers to being able to be tested in their work sites uh, whenever the need arises. And not just doing it once, but doing it anytime 
If somebody is negative one day, they could very easily be positive the next day, because as we know, it takes probably up to five days to have enough virus to be able to test positive on a test. So our, our other mission and our, and our letter to the governor is to ensure that there is enough, there are enough beds within uh, the Commonwealth. And what we have seen with this COVID virus, unfortunately, is patients are very, very sick. So although we've set up alternatives for um, uh, mild to moderate cases of the virus and recovery of the virus in some of our, uh, the seaport and many of the other stand up hospitals, what we're seeing in the hospitals as we've seen more and more patients requiring intensive care level of care. Uh, patients come in, get very sick very quickly, and require that critical care level. Uh, so we are seeing a lot of that. Um, let's see, what else? Um, unfortunately, we continue to see staff layoffs at some of the hospitals. This is absolutely the worst time during a pandemic to be laying off anyone. Um, as a pediatric nurse, I may not be the nurse that will be able to fully care for a patient in the intensive care unit, but my skills are so important to be that second pair of eyes and that second pair of hands for the nurses that are caring for the patients in the critical care area. So our ask has always been is that there not be any layoffs, but a redeployment uh, and certainly having all hands on deck for this pandemic. Um, we've also asked for housing so that if someone is uh, somewhat exposed or is going to work and caring for patients in that critical state, and they're concerned about bringing the virus home, that there be alternative housing available so that they're not bringing the virus home or transmitting it on their way from home. So I think I will end there. Um, I think I might have used up my five or six minutes, but- um, I'm Almost right on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> I always have so much to say, um, but um, I just wanna thank everyone who has heeded the warning and is staying home. And if you do have to go out, please wear a mask. It's the most important thing you can do to not only protect yourself, but protect others around you. So thank you so much for having this opportunity. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Donna. We really appreciate your being here. Uh, Vaughn. Vaughn. Hi, everyone. Do you hear me? Yes, we can. I just want to say okay. a little bit more about you, if I might. Uh, sure. Vaughn is a senior organizer with 1199 SEIU United Healthcare Workers East. He's responsible for organizing and developing leaders in home care in Metro Boston. Uh, these are the workers who care for seniors and people with disabilities at home. Vaughn's parents were organizers before him, and he is a labor activist who supports the Poor People's Campaign. Thank you, Vaughn, for being here. All right, so thank you. Um, I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. Just a little bit of a background about uh, PCAs. The PCAs that I deal with are home care workers under uh, mass health. Uh, if a, a person with a disability or a senior qualifies for mass health then they can get a personal care attendant for themselves pcas when i first came to the commonwealth of massachusetts there were about 2000 uh, due to our organizing efforts and the growth of, of in home care pcas now cover about uh, 55,000 uh, throughout the whole state uh, and in the metro boston area there are about uh, 9,000. most of them are uh, are uh, people of color uh, they are largely uh, Latino, uh, Haitian, uh, uh, Cape Verdean Creole. Uh, many of them are, 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 are Chinese. So we have a variety of, of different cultures. Um, and what has happened, uh, PCAs have been able to achieve uh, uh, the highest starting rate in the country. Yes. Hello? PCAs have been able to achieve the highest starting rate in the country, which is $15.40 an hour. But because of uh, the, the living standard in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for everyone, uh, that in, in many instances is, is not enough. Uh, most PCAs work on a, on a part-time basis. They don't work on a full-time basis. The turnover rate is about 70%. Uh, and because of COVID-19, they take care of people with disabilities and seniors in their homes. And a lot of seniors and people with disabilities, once 
they found out about, about COVID-19 uh, became, became those who were scared to have a PCA come into their house. Uh, and a lot of PCAs with pre-existing conditions such as asthma or diabetes uh, really became concerned about going to care for a person with a disability. Also, a lot of PCAs are those that work in nursing homes. They have to work other jobs. And if you know about COVID-19 in nursing homes, you know that that is one of the places where a lot of COVID-19 uh, uh, exists. So as a result of, of uh, this, this uh, being the case, there's been a lot of scare, a lot of fear uh, among PCAs in the Metro Boston area. The main thing that PCAs say they want for themselves is PPE. Uh, you know, it's not being supplied by uh, governmental forces that exist. We have had to go about uh, various means to try to obtain uh, PPE for uh, PCAs and others. Uh, and it, it's, it's, been, it's been really hard. Uh, we have gotten shipments of PPE from different sources through uh, different means. And as soon as we get it in, we have to distribute it. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, been trying to find places that test because there are a lot of PCAs who uh, may have tested positive. Uh, and so what we're doing right now is spending the largest majority of our time uh, going around uh, distributing PPE, uh, trying to answer questions that uh, PCAs have had. We've been going over the protocol for COVID-19 uh, that has been provided to us by uh, uh, MassGov as well as by uh, the CDC. And meanwhile, we're trying to put as much pressure as we can on the federal government because we realize that is where the problem lies. Uh, and, and PCAs, healthcare workers need PPE. We've had distribution sites uh, in Boston, we distributed over 200 uh, 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 packages of gloves and masks. Uh, we, we, we've done the same in Brockton. Uh, we're trying to focus our efforts uh, on uh, Chelsea because we realize Glorious Vega is on the call. Glad to have you on, Gloria. Uh, you know, that that area is an area uh, that needs focus. Uh, and uh, trying to have weekly calls for PCAs to educate them about the protocols and just you know, try to answer any questions that they have. And, and you know, so we are, we are doing everything we can. In, the, in, in addition to that, it's always about leadership development, making sure that we have member leaders on the ground that are there to help in different neighborhoods that we have. Because even though we have a lot of members, we need members that are on the ground making things happen. Uh, and so that's, that's where uh, the majority of our time uh, is, is spent. Uh, at the, at this moment, I hope that covered my six minutes. Um, there we go. Yes, you're you're also right on the target. You're making my okay. job very easy tonight. <laughs> okay. Vaughn, you mentioned something so important that it's the federal government that is uh, more more of the problem. And uh, at some point, we will send around some information about how our discretionary tax money is spent. And then we can understand pretty easily why uh, the state is in this predicament, uh, because most of our money uh, is not going into things like education, health care, public transit, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, thank you, Vaughn, very much. Uh, moving along, uh, Pam, Dr. Pam Edelstein works at the Codman Square Health Center where she practices family medicine, acupuncture, and mind-body medicine. Pam's impassioned Facebook post on March 22nd about the tremendous effort of staff at the health center to reorganize what they do to meet the challenge of providing care during the pandemic and also to take care of staff has provided a lot of energy for the planning of this webinar today. So thanks a lot for that, Pam. Thank you. So um, as, um, I'm grateful for this opportunity to be here and to also share what it's like to be on the front lines. So I work at Codman Square Health Center, and um, but I need to say that I'm expressing my views. I'm not representing the health center. Um, and we serve a patient population 
that is um, economically and socially stressed. A lot of patients are immigrant, a lot of people are immigrants and um, are not, are um, underserved. We are federally funded. And what Rosemary was alluding to is that we reorganized our whole entire health center. We now basically dismantled our existing units and we have everybody go through a triage tent in the front. What happens is the triage tent calls a nurse who then speaks with the patient and then the patient either gets sent to a unit where patients with COVID-like symptoms are seen or a unit where patients without COVID symptoms are seen. And that's so that we can, um, we can make sure that we're not using our PPE. We're, we'll, we're, making, we're using our PPE wisely. It's to help decrease spread. And um, for the first time in a health center, we're telling our patients not to come. We're doing telephone med medicine. Parts of our certain units in our health center are like ghost areas. And we have had to furlough staff, which during a healthcare crisis seems incredibly ironic and extremely disappointing. What that does is it stresses the rest of us who are there because normally the people who would be there to, to be part of the team are not present. So we are really in a triage mode, but we still have our patients with chronic diseases such as hypertension, diabetes, um, chronic pain, et cetera. And all of those diseases are really exacerbated by stress, by lack of exercise, by lack of food, which is basically what we're seeing now during COVID. Um, we do have adequate PPE right now for providers and staff. We've been blessed with a lot of donations. Our grant people are working extremely hard. And um, I will say that all of us who come home, we basically strip at the doorway, shower as soon as possible. We, continue, we consider our cars contaminated. So it does represent a change in our way of life. Our staff is scared. They're juggling childcare. They have their own comorbidities. So it's some people are nervous to work in the unit where patients are seen who have COVID-like symptoms, and that's really difficult. Our patients are also scared. They're anxious. They miss seeing their provider because they're seeing the provider of the day, and it's hard to find the time to reach out to them, and, and talking on the phone is nowhere near as satisfying as being seen in person. Um, Dorchester and its surrounding areas has higher rates of COVID. There's been a lot, some press, a, seems like a good deal of press about structural racism. What we found, or what I think some things that account for that is um, social distancing really is a privilege. Our patients live in small cramped quarters where it's easy to spread. There's multiple generations caring for one another and that contributes to spread. There's not a second bathroom to when someone's isolating. They, um, you know, they can't exercise, they can't go to a yard, they can't do things that could help decrease their anxiety. And um, one thing that is always in the back of our minds is someone, someone's home might not be safe. Um, there might be intimate partner violence um, for the LGBTQ community. Sometimes it might not be safe to be at home. So we, have, we worry about them. Um, our patients are getting sick. They are dying. They need medications. They're th they, need, they don't have thermometers or blood pressure cuffs. They come in for prescriptions and letters, and yet they still have this amazing, amazing attitude. And as a primary care physician, I can say that it feels very surreal um, because everything is being made up on the go, and oftentimes we're having to reroute our protocols. It almost feels like being in the dark all the time and then when you walk outside you're in this bright light that's how it feels kind of to leave the world of the health center um you know it's a lot of time away from family our staff has been extremely devoted we're all worried that we're going to transmit covid to our families um, especially if we could be asymptomatic carriers and um you know we certainly we're losing a lot of money and we just, Mayor Marty Walsh asked our health center, among other health centers, to create a tent for community testing, which just went up on Friday. And that has introduced a whole new workflow where it's hard to find the people power and the ability to do this for them. Just one family, one example. I have a patient who, um, she's in her late 70s. She has multiple comorbidities. 
And her daughter said to me when I called her to tell her about the COVID diagnosis, how did my mother get COVID? She's been at home for three and a half weeks. And it turns out that her mother happened to have elective surgery at a hospital right before the hospital started canceling the elective surgeries. So she must have contracted COVID there. All of her daughters, her one daughter who lives with her and the daughter who drove her home and who attends to her then had similar symptoms. And I think that's a really great example of how, um, how it can spread. And just by doing something so innocuous, like taking care of a family member, um, then everybody else contracts COVID. I just wanna close with a poem um, that I wrote uh, called Yesterday, because I wrote it about the day prior. And it's about my time um, working in what's called the ILI unit, influenza-like illness unit, where we test patients to see if they have COVID. I enter the exam room. No handshake, no hug, we don't know each other. Masked, gloved, sniffling, you hunch in your seat, quivering. An essential worker, you minister to the marginalized in our society. What if you test positive? How do you isolate? when you're the only one who can care for your kids. You look like a regular person. You are anyone and everyone. You are not the COVID case I envision when I read the news. As a family physician, relationships are the medicine. Today, all talk is perfunctory, minimal pleasantries. Nonverbal expression lost beneath my PPE. Words muffled by the masks that leave red indentations on my face. Time equals exposure. In and out is best. I pass you the swab, in one nostril, twist twice, count to 15, repeat on the other side. I coach you, count with you. Your, your eyes widen, brimming with tears, lock with my eyes through my face shield as you swab side one. You shut your eyes and the tears fall as you swab side two. So thank you very much. Thank you, Pam. Wow. That's a powerful uh, situation you're in many times a day. Hmm. Well, Gladys, um, we are so happy that you are with us. Um, Gladys Vega is executive director of the Chelsea Collaborative, which she joined in 1990, uh, becoming the executive director in 2006. Gladys is the architect of most of the collaborative's community coalitions. She's played a leadership role in organizing for immigrants' rights, welfare rights, tennis rights, open space, and the environment, for multicultural and anti-racism programs, and in numerous grassroots campaigns. Thank you, Gladys, for being with us. Thank you, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me now. We can. Yep. Oh, okay. So, um, so I am grateful to be here. Sorry about my voice. I haven't had the best voice just because I'm out in the field and I have 16 hour days every day. But oh. I, um, as, the, um, as the prior speaker was saying, you know, my life has com changed completely. I don't know more. When my joy was to come home and have my two grandkids, one who's three and another one that is five run to the door and say, Abuela, and I'll be like all over them, and how was your day, and just very playful. Now I sneak through the back door, I take my clothes off, I spray Lysol on my curly hair, um, I get in a rope or a towel in the basement, I don't let, I don't touch anything because I have a son who has chronic diabetes, type 1, and whose numbers are completely off. He can be Yesterday he was 42, so he um, so he can go very high and very low. Um, so it's a it's a new way of being, a new way of living, and also feeling a guilt that I'm every day I'm exposing myself for 16 hours a day, and then coming home and being worried if someone gets sick here. Um, my son-in-law and I are the only ones that get out. He's a police officer. My daughter's a city council. And although she does everything from home, the police officer and I are the ones that are like in the front lines. She also volunteers at times. And I'm always Melinda, you know, we have to just be extremely careful. I'd rather have you at home 
with the kids that have someone else get sick and bring germs to the house. I think what I'm so bothered by this coronavirus is the lack of breaking the rules for the testing. I got extremely overwhelmed that right now I have 875, 74 people today, positive coronavirus case. 47 people have passed. And I think what I've been so overwhelmed with is the fact that this pandemic, you know, happened globally, right? And here we are in Massachusetts waiting for some type of guidelines, for some type of testing while people are dying and while you're taking care of your significant other and you're being denied a test and being sent home to isolate, but then you don't get any resources and you're rooming around Chelsea spreading the virus because although you were told to isolate, oh, they didn't do the test, I may be okay. I didn't have all the symptoms, maybe it's the flu. And um, so I, I tell you in the past three weeks, so we've been there for a month and a week, but in the past three weeks, it has hit me so hard, the agony of not being able to have my friends be tested. My friends calling, you know, Gladys, I went to MGH twice, I went to Beth Israel, and they told me stay home and be in isolation, but nobody follows up with them. Nobody, like if you're gonna put me in isolation, because you're waiting for some type of guidelines, then just check on me. Send someone to check on me. So we have begun to be case managers. So I did the food pantry, the Papa food pantry. I don't know anything about food, but I did it because I wanted four staff members of mine with their phones talking to people on the, while people are distancing to pick up food. And we found there other stories. I had a guy, um, that was in line with COVID-19. His wife was at home, very, very sick. Her temperature was 103. He had no food for his two children, so he got in the food line. You know, our community is that community that has contributed to building Massachusetts, right? They're the frontline service workers. They work in the airport. They work in Boston cleaning offices. I don't have executives that are, can be able to be quarantined. I have people that are normally working in the soldier's home, in the Jewish nursing home, in East Point nursing home. Um, those are the people that got sick not knowing that they had the virus and they brought it home. I found a family whose um, father-in-law, um, son, his son-in-law was basically saying, you need to leave my house. I have a three-month-old baby. And if you don't leave the house, um, I'm going to put you on the porch, but you're not coming in this house because you have COVID-19. He went to MGH twice and they denied the test and they told him isolate. When the son-in-law found out that he was told to isolate, the son-in-law said, not in my house. I have a three-year-old baby, a three-month-year-old baby. My wife had a C-section. I'm not keeping them here. I'm not keeping him. So we called, um, the, uh, another hospital to be tested didn't happen. He had 103. So I said, you know what? I'm going to call him um, 911. Call 911. One of my staff members, Sylvia Ramirez. I said, Kill, Sylvia, call. I'm going to be with the daughter on the phone. She was crying. She's kicking her father out because she's protecting her newborn baby. Um, we put him in an ambulance, and now he's in intensive care in the Boston Medical Center. Wow. Um, wow. In the meantime, he was almost dying in his house and dealing with being kicked out of the house. And cases like that repeat every, every day. So our situation is horrific, it's larger. This 874 cases, that is not our numbers. Our numbers are probably up to 3,000 plus cases, if less. I mean, yeah, so Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, this is what we hear when we hear people who are really on the front lines speaking about um, the situation and what is needed. Uh, I hope we can hear during the question time, maybe we can hear some more about that. Julie, uh, we'll, we'll go to Dr. Julie Levison, uh, who practices infectious disease uh, medicine at the Chelsea MGH Healthcare Center. 
and does research focusing on disparities in healthcare. Thanks for being here, Julie. Thank you for having me. It's um, such an honor to be with all of you. I think uh, I'm particularly Gladys, who we're on these pandemic calls every day at four and to see your face, Gladys, mm -hmm. rather than the audio is so heartening. I think um, one of the things that can be so anxiety provoking and distressing about an emerging infectious disease like this is the sense of isolation that we feel when we're physically separated. So the fact that we can have an evening like this and be connected in this way provides a tremendous sense of solidarity. So I want to thank the group for this occasion. I thought um, I'd, I'd talk briefly about Chelsea because it's such um, a, a wonderful city and has been um, uh, affected so deeply by this um, uh, infection. And, and I think that it's emblematic of a lot of stories that are affecting our communities, not only in Massachusetts, but um, across the state. So Chelsea has about 40,000 residents has, and has long been the home of, of uh, immigrants. Um, we're 60% um, Latino, uh, large portion uh, non-US born, 80% essential workers. And it's this mix of both our diversity, but also these characteristics that together provide this vulnerability. Um, so, uh, like Gladys and others have been saying, not only um, population density, but the intergenerational characteristic of households with, um, for example, grandparents who are with um, young children who now as we're learning more and more about um, SARS-CoV-2 that, um, that children may have mild to no symptoms and be uh, transmitting the infection within um, dense households to individuals who are more vulnerable. Um, so there are many of these qualities and that place Chelsea at, at risk as well as our, many of our other cities like Lawrence, East Boston, Brockton. Um, I, I think that um, with that Chelsea specific um, vulnerability is a larger societal issue about the, the retraction of public health investment. Um, and that um, even despite Massachusetts being quite a sophisticated state, um, that we are really challenged um, to be able to respond appropriately. I, I cannot emphasize enough, we, we know what can control an outbreak. You need testing, you need to be able to identify individuals who are infected, you need to be able to contract tech trace and safely isolate people while protecting the healthcare force. One of the things that, for example, HIV, which I think is an important model, we HIV testing has expanded, um, but yet it has long been called the test that leads to nowhere. And that's because in order, when you get the test, the key thing is to do something with the test. Well, the same thing I think Gladys was mentioning about safe housing. Yes, testing is, scarce, even when we have a test, we need to be able to adequately do something with those results. So if we are suspect that someone uh, has infection, we need to be able to isolate them safely. So that means that we need housing that's available. It's very difficult to isolate, even under the best of circumstances. So the, the lack um, of um, safe housing um, is, is a tremendous barrier and we really are challenged by integrating that kind of case management assessment into our clinical workflow. We want to be able to ask questions that we can do something about, but we know that the vulnerabilities to safely isolate are multitude and they include concerns about domestic violence and interpersonal violence at, in the home. Uh, food is a major issue. That's one of the main themes that we talk about on our pandemic calls is assuring that individuals have enough food during their period of isolation, housing and homelessness, again. Um, uh, so, so we need to be able to triage in a holistic way um, that adequately addresses people's vulnerability to transmission. Um, and then I think, you know, we've been talking about um, the overwhelming crisis. And then I think it is so important to remember the strengths because I think, for example, Chelsea has such a um, uh, re resilient qualities. I think about these 
daily pandemic calls that we have. Um, Chelsea has created a pandemic preparedness team. Essentially anyone can join at 4 p.m. to call in. There are 11 subgroups and it's really an example of what can happen when a community comes together to answer the problems that they know exist. Um, from mental health and substance use, there's a subcommittee on, on activities, on food. Um, so I think that kind of whole of society of approach um, is absolutely essential and it's happening um, from, from local organizations getting together to get the job done. Um, uh, so I think I'll, I'll end there. The last part I'll mention, the mental health aspect, and I know that all of us have been concerned about that. Uh, one of the things that um, at MGH where I practice, we were quite concerned as we were learning what was happening in China was how how we were going to protect um, healthcare workers on the front lines. So we began to develop a resilience training program that's now operationalized in a video-based format for all of our healthcare providers. It doesn't change the structural issues that Donna and others have mentioned, but it does um, provide some coping skills around self-compassion, mindfulness, um, ways that as individuals, when we can't always change the environment that we're in, how we can control our reaction to it. So um, I'll end there and just to say thank you for uh, allowing me to be part of this group. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Julie. So moving along, we'll hear from Savina Martin. Savina is a lifelong activist and organizer. She's an Army veteran. She's organized around the effects of the war on drugs on homeless men, women, and veterans in both Boston and San Diego. She is the Eastern Chair of the Massachusetts Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Savine is on the board of Mass Peace Action, and she brings us the powerful message of the need for a moral budget in Massachusetts and in the nation. Thanks, Savina. Well, thank you to Rose Mary and to everyone else that's uh, been on this most important webinar um, in this most important time uh, in our country and the world. Um, so yeah, I've, uh, um, I'm have i gonna talk a little bit about uh, what's happening with the Poor People's Campaign as we've been on the front line. Um, so, so recently, uh, the Poor People's Campaign uh, released a set of demands by first describing how um, epidemics emerge along the fissures of our society, um, reflecting not only the biology of the infectious agent, but patterns of mar marginalization, right? Exclusion and discrimination. The coronavirus pandemic is no exception and is rooted uh, like in decades of systemic racism poverty, ecological devastation, militarism, and of course, a false moral narrative of religious extremism. As frontline organizers, we witness firsthand the devastation of the war economy on our black and brown communities. We know something is wrong, and something is wrong when a virus emerges in the midst of the long existing open wounds uh, of the United States. Wounds from generations of racist policies and the criminalization of poverty. We know something is wrong when before a single diagnosis of COVID-19, nearly 700 people died every day from poverty in the US. Yet America can find billions and trillions of dollars to give to the military. And at the same time, deem healthcare luxury. So something is very wrong. Our state's fact sheets, the Poor People's Campaign fact sheet, um, highlight some of the deep fissures of poverty that show up disproportionately in the black and brown community throughout the state. We see how racism shows up in our black prison populations, whereby we are incarcerated almost eight times the rate of, of uh, as whites. As of 2019, Massachusetts had let's see, about 18 ICE detention centers. Uh, we have already had over 8,000 deportations. And this, these are numbers back uh, that date back to 20, 2003 and 2018, as well as many other immigration cases that are pending. 
We have over 85,000 veterans with incomes below $35,000. This is Massachusetts 21% of veteran populations as of 2015. And as of 2016 monthly, about 779,000 people benefit from the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Now, as of 2018, there's about 181,200 people that are uninsured, right? And it is also estimated that over 20,000 people, and we're pretty sure the numbers are higher, are homeless. Uh, and over a million uh, make under $15 an hour. So we know something is historically wrong here. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced us into like unprecedented national emergency. And this emergency, however, results from a deeper and more and a much longer term crisis. That of poverty and inequality and of society that ignores the needs of the poor and who are also a $400 emergency away from being poor. So I ask you, are the testing sites set up along the peripherals of the poorest communities? Are we assuring that somehow neighborhood markets and little to no grocery stores are stocked with food items? In these marginalized communities, how are families obtaining transportation to stores, work, and then back home again? How many families have no internet? And are emergency urgent care centers open? And what about emotional health options, service, toolkits, gloves? I'm talking right now about Roxbury, the Orchard Gardens Community Projects, Mission Hill, I'm talking about Dorchester, Mattapan. Who is available to talk or to answer concerns? And where are our black and brown health workers? The Poor People's Moral Budget calls for cutting $300 billion from the bloated military budget and transferring them to public health and human needs. $300 billion would pay for all the tests, masks, gowns, and ventilators people need. The funds would speed the development of vaccines to prevent the disease and therapies to cure the infections. We need to stop making war on people abroad and pivot to making war on the coronavirus. We've gone through the war on drugs, the war on poverty, uh, civil rights movement, and on and on and on. And today we're fighting the coronavirus and our numbers are spiked where we're not getting any real, real answers. We are now witnessing dire need of critical attention immediately. We call on you to fulfill your moral and constitutional responsibilities. And this is a part of our demand uh, um, um, summary. Expand the COVID-19 emergency provisions to care for us all and enact our moral budget immediately. We cannot return to normal. Addressing the depth of the crisis that have been revealed in this pandemic means enacting universal health care expanding social welfare programs, ensuring access to water and sanitation, cash assistance to poor and low income families, good jobs, living wages, and an annual income and protecting our democracy. It means ensuring that our abundant national resources are used for the general welfare instead of war, walls, and the wealthy. Our call to action is to immediately enact the demands of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, and to fully address the COVID-19 outbreak and the underlying crisis of poverty and inequality that made so many vulnerable people right now. Um, so thank you. thank you. Really appreciate uh, you inviting us here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sabina. Uh, that's a very good uh, summary and uh, ending point for all of your moving testimony. Um, Brian Garvey is our Peace Action Community Organizer and he's going to uh, read out some of the questions that people have been asking. Um, and uh, whoever is so inspired, please respond. Brian, thanks. thanks. 
Thanks. And I, I did try and, and get who the uh, questions were directed towards, um, which I think will be a little more helpful, uh, hopefully. But uh, if someone else can jump in if necessary. Um, this is from James Wilberforce, and I believe it's a question for Donna Kelly Williams. Um, is Governor Baker representing the situation correctly in his daily briefings, uh, in your opinion? In, in my opinion, um, he is, but uh, that was that what, what is warranting our writing of the letter every week to ensure that he is hearing from people on the front line. Um, and I do hear what everyone else said about the importance of having the testing available for everyone. People should not have to be traveling far from their home to be tested. This is a time when we have to be testing everyone so that we can decrease the transmission and fight this awful virus. So I hope that answers that question. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Uh, moving right along, this one is, is for you, uh, Vaughn. Uh, are, are people, are, are, your, uh, are your workers, are they uh, afraid of retaliation uh, for, for speaking out uh, on problems that they, that they are seeing um, in, in the workplace? Uh, no, they aren't because uh, most of the people they take care of are people with disabilities. People with disabilities and seniors need PPE just as much as uh, the people that take care of them. So basically they're both uh, in the fight for more PPE and, um, and, and it's really directed straight at the, uh, the, the Trump administration for uh, not providing the PPE that should be uh, made available uh, during this pandemic. So uh, er all people with disabilities, all seniors and others are with us in the fight. So no, they are not worried about retaliation. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Um, this next question is for uh, Dr. Dr. Pam. Uh, you said that you uh, have you're in the, in the habit of uh, changing clothes when you when you get home uh, from a shift. Uh, would you recommend the same for uh, people going to the grocery store, for instance? Um, I think an abundance of caution doesn't. Hurts. I think certainly um, there's been, you know, washing your hands, <clears throat> touching any, you know, washing, washing things down that could have been in contact with others. Um, some people do recommend that. I don't think there's, I haven't come across a real, across a real solid recommendation, however, but I think being cautious will help and it also help decrease your anxiety, which is also really critical. Thanks, thanks. This next uh, question is for Gladys. Um, it's from Josephine McNeil, uh, or also uh, for Dr. Judy as well. Um, how can people outside of Chelsea help uh, with, what, with what you both are dealing with uh, in Chelsea right now? So I think that the way to help is to, by reaching out to the Chelsea Collaborative, to the pandemic team, I think we need help like doing deliveries. We have elderly that are homebound with the virus or in isolation that were not tested. We deliver at least 75 meals a day. Today, I have probably 15 calls for people that in need of diapers. So my Sundays somehow have become delivering diapers. Um, so I, say, I would say, I urge you to join by helping. Um, if you're not able to get out of your house, we are doing unemployment applications. You don't need to be bilingual. We'll give you a video. And many of our workers, they spoke, you know, they speak English. They give you the information virtually and you do it. And my last request is that Governor Baker is doing everything that he can, but he would do much more in communities if the medical fields of the medical people would say, we have 874 people, but we have sent 3,000 people home with the COVID virus symptoms in isolation. And that's what mm. I get upset about, that mm. when, when the medical people that are doing an amazing job are not yelling and say, listen, we need more tests. And we need more tests because right now there's 3,000 people in isolation. People have come here twice to seek testing and they haven't been able to. 
So I want those numbers to be, to be told. I want the story of the people that are in installation because we're not addressing them. When they call City Hall for deliveries, if you're not in isolation, they may not put you in a hotel. I had a guy that we were ready to put him in a hotel and he wasn't because he wasn't COVID-19. So if, so being in ice, people say, why would you care about a test? I do care about a test because it comes with a story and it comes with a story of helping that individual. If not, they're isolation on their own. And I just want to correct the, the woman, that spoke, the doctor that spoke about Chelsea. Um, we don't have 40,000 people. That was 10 years ago. Census indicated 38,000 people 10 years ago. We have 2014. We have the wave of immigrants in so many ways. We have had to build a building, a high school building, after the schools were built. So my numbers in terms of uh, with my grant, my development team, we are like probably 75,000 to 80,000 people in Chelsea. If you can see all the new apartments, where do you think they're putting them? We have plenty of new housing and that comes with, and then with the undocumented families, it's gentrification. We're suffering the problem of gentrification. That is why you may have a three bedroom apartment with four different families, including the living room used for another family. That's what, that's what the situation is in Chelsea. So people nice. are living nice. over cloudy conditions. So that allows for the spread to immediately happen because we're living in overcrowded rooms. Thank you, Gladys. I really appreciate that. I want to give uh, uh, Dr. Levison a chance to talk and uh, also perhaps to answer another question that I got uh, about uh, the quality of the testing. Uh, I think Donna was talking earlier about the number of false negatives and someone asked uh, when, when we could expect to get uh, more effective testing uh, kits. I think that... Take that. Ms. Vega's point is, um, I appreciate so much that if we can accurately count the numbers, we don't know the resources, the amount of resources that are truly needed. And that is, um, um, as physicians, we, we have been tr uh, trying through our, we wrote a paper in the Boston Herald about uh, three weeks ago now, um, calling for uh, a large deployment of testing with contact tracers. It was the following day that the governor um, announced the plan for contact tracing. So we are, Gladys, we are singing that song together. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that the other part that is so moving and so important, and I, and I say this as a public health physician, the stories and the lives of um, the suffering and the strength, but the, the hardship is so important because when we see the numbers, we detach ourselves from actually um, the experience. So I, I, I agree completely with you. And we know the difficulties in getting accurate census numbers for all of the reasons that we understand about concerns and in reporting. Um, regarding the testing, there have been many reasons why there have been hiccups along the way with testing. One of the things that's been quite remarkable um, outside of the government, but in terms of industry, science, uh, scientists and academicians, coming together at full force pace to try to make advances to advance testing. Um, the MGH did stand up an in-house test after emergency approval from the FDA to start uh, testing so that we could um, try to enumerate these cases. Uh, so I think that there um, is a groundswell of interest in, in, in trying to improve the ability of detection. Both, um, you know, the swab testing that we're talking about, which is a PCR-based test, which looks for virus, as well as antibody, doesn't tell us fully about infectivity because you can shed virus and not necessarily be um, uh, fully infective. So um, hopefully with antigen-based testing where we can really get a sense of, of how infective someone is, that will be helpful. Um, this is an area of um, active, active uh, scientific advancement. So I hope that um, when we have the next call for this, that we'll have much more um, optimistic story to tell around that. And um, I'm pleased to see that there has been some mobile testing in Chelsea, 
We need more testing outside of healthcare facilities that are done in a way that brings in effective communities into our planning as to how that testing is really gonna occur. So it's done in a way where there are not surprises, there's not fear that it's done hand in hand with community boards. Thank you, doctor, appreciate it. Uh, I think we have time for one final question. Uh, and this is from, let's see, it's from James Wilberforce, uh, actually. Uh, and it's for Sabina Martin. Uh, wondering if you could comment on uh, how people experiencing homelessness uh, are dealing with uh, the COVID-19 crisis. I, I know uh, uh, you can speak to that very well. Yeah, well, we know that um, this is a population that has not been doing well at all. We are really seeing the manifestations of Can you hear me? Of abject failure uh, on the part of uh, the administrations, not only here in Boston or Massachusetts, but all across the country. Uh, we are looking at, the, at, at uh, homelessness uh, through a lens where it, it just seems like right now, everyone is totally confused about how to facilitate our homeless uh, brothers and sisters. Although uh, testing is happening in some spaces, Boston Medical Center is, you know, just opened up some places, Brighton also opened up uh, and also Suffolk University, we still have a very, very long way to go. And we're at a surge now on the ground uh, that it's, it's just, it, it's not going to look well. Right? It's just not going to look well. And, and how are we really going to annotate and track and trace people that don't have uh, an address? Um, uh, it's just really complex. It's, it's very difficult. But uh, we've been on the ground fighting this situation for many, many, many years. I mean, and since the Long Island Bridge closed and the creation of Methadone Mile and this ecosystem of, of men and women that have a multiplicity, a myriad of different uh, socio and economic uh, problems. So um, I'm not even going to, to, to really you know, give an answer. There is none and there are no real strategies. We are in an emergency and, and we're building this plane while flying it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Brian. Our time is just about gone. Um, thank you, Sabina, for pointing out that even before the COVID epidemic, pandemic, uh, 700 poor people died per day, uh, basically of poverty and all that goes with it in, in this country. So uh, we, we don't want to go back to what was normal. We need to kind of seize the opportunity to improve things as you were listing out what we need to do. Cole, do you have the uh, slide or the notice of the two uh, web addresses people can go to to make donations? I yeah. uh, thought I had it there. Yeah, here yeah. it is. Yep, yep, thank you. Uh, so here we have the Chelsea Collaborative. Uh, if you go to their website, chelseacollab.org, the donate button is just below the great photo of the staff. And also for Codman Square Health Center, codman.org, and you go scroll to the bottom and you'll see the donate button. So anybody who can't take action uh, on the phone or in person, this is another opportunity to help. Um, I just feel so appreciative of all of you sharing your time uh, when obviously very trying times for you. Um, we will have another webinar um, May 17 on economic disparities in healthcare. So we look forward to uh, uh, joining in conversation uh, then and seeing where we're at then. It's the other point that we do. We have one on the third too, don't we, Rosemary? What's happening then? I, I don't know the title. It's every two weeks, but it's, this, it's the state legislator's view. Oh, okay, great. Speaking of the state, we do need to be pushing the governor, um, as uh, a number of you told us, especially Gladys, uh, 
reminding him that people are not getting tested. They're being sent home when they have symptoms and coming to pick up food when they have a temperature of 103. So I think the more contact we have with the governor's office, the better. Um, calls, emails, and uh, online. Uh, anything else, Cole or Brian? Sure, I just want to thank everyone uh, for your time. Um, it's been very valuable uh, for me uh, to hear from, from those on the front line. And uh, we want you to know that we in the peace community, uh, we, we deeply believe in intersectionality. Um, so healthcare is a peace issue. Um, and peace is a health issue. Um, those of us that are pushing for change, we need to stand together and, uh, and realize that all our issues are the same. Um, and through that, through that intersectionality, that's how we're going to actually make change in this country. Uh, so I just want to thank you all. Thank you. Uh, in that spirit, I'll just put up this picture that uh, some of our European uh, colleagues made for tax day, which uh, was supposed to have been on Wednesday. Uh, but was postponed, and it's just trying to show uh, the massive expense of the military equipment. And, it, you know, if you had spent that money on things like ICU beds, nurses, ambulances, doctors, ventilators, and all the other healthcare materials, how much better off we would be. What really makes us safe, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Donna, Vaughn, Pam, Gladys, Julie, and Savina. Thank you so very much. Thank, Thank you. you for your work. We really appreciate it. We'll see you it. in a couple of weeks again. Ciao. Thank you. Bye-bye.